first thing I'd like to do is a, give a little bit of a review from last time of what we talked about. So last time we ended chapter two, which was a discussion of stereochemistry, and one of the last things we talked about was the energy of stereoisomerism. So keep in mind that enantiomers are equal in energy and display equal reactivity with the exception of reactions with other chiral non racemic molecules, whereas diastereomers are different in energy and so react in different ways with all kinds of molecules. They actually have different internal distances, so they behave different chemically. And we can take advantage of that difference to separate enantiomers. So if we convert two enantiomers into diastereomers of each other, we can then separate them using conventional techniques. But today we're going to transition into talking about the cycloalkanes. We're, talk we're going to talk about the cycloalkanes because I think they illustrate nicely a lot of the principles we covered in the uh, first two chapters. So first chapter we looked at molecular structure in terms of Lewis structures as well as molecular orbitals. And then in chapter two we transitioned into stereochemistry. And we're going to look at both of these things in our study of the cycloalkanes. But before we get there, first thing I wanted to look at was just some basic information about what the cycloalkanes are and why they're important to organic chemists. So the cycloalkanes are cyclic, fully saturated arrangements of carbon atoms. The bottom of this slide, you can see an example of cyclohexane and its open chain form hexane or n-hexane above it there. And the fact that they're cyclic gives them some interesting physical properties that we can predict based on their molecular structure. So what we observe is that they have possess higher boiling points, melting points, and density than their open chain analogs. So cyclohexane, for instance, has a higher boiling point, higher melting point, and higher density than its open chain analog. And the reason for that has to do with intramolecular forces that are present in the cyclic form that are not quite as strong in the open chain form. So if you look here, when you think about the boiling point of a compound, it has to do with the extent of intramolecular forces within the compound. So boiling is the evaporation of molecules above the liquid. If forces within the liquid are very strong, then the boiling point of the compound will clearly be very low, whereas weak intramolecular forces, as they're called, will lead to a compound with a very low boiling point. For instance, methane, hydrogen, the very small gases all have extremely low boiling points. So clearly there must be a difference in intramolecular forces between cyclohexane and hexane. The difference stems from their different molecular shapes. So cyclohexane being bound up in this cyclic form has a lot more surface area to present to um, other cyclohexane molecules around it. That leads to an increase in what are called London dispersion forces. And if you've taken general chemistry, you've probably heard this term before. These are forces that result from instantaneous dipoles within molecules. So at any given moment in time, the electrons in cyclohexane must possess some distribution that's typically asymmetric. So we might have a slight, tiny positive charge on one end of the molecule and a tiny negative charge on the other end. Those dipoles can interact with other dipoles on nearby molecules, and that's a kind of intramolecular force. That intramolecular force holds the molecules together, and as I just described, keeps the boiling points and melting points rather high. It takes a lot of energy in the form of temperature to convert cyclohexane into a gas, at least relative to its open chain form. If you're wondering about some practical applications of the cycloalkanes, just think about petroleum and gasoline products. So a big component of petroleum is, um, for instance, octane. You hear the, the word octane in that context quite a bit. That is an open chain hydrocarbon. So the hydrocarbons, including the cyclic hydrocarbons that we'll talk about here, have some real world applications. So first thing I want to talk about is nomenclature of the cycloalkanes. So we didn't say much about nomenclature actually in chapter one, but you should be familiar with it at least to sort of keep yourself calibrated. There are a number of tools out there that will allow you to name compounds quickly and easily uh, just by drawing the compound and then clicking a button to see its name, but knowing the nomenclature is useful 
nonetheless. So the way we name the open chain forms is with certain prefixes. And I put wiki alert up here at the top of this slide just because the wiki goes into this in more detail. But what I've given here, you here is a few examples of how we name cyclic hydrocarbons. So we use the prefix prop, for instance, to de designate three carbons. So the open chain three carbon alkane is called propane. The suffix ane refers to the fact that the molecule is fully saturated and contains only hydrogen and carbon. So looking here, we see we have cyclopropane up here in the upper left, followed by cyclobutane. We use the but um, prefix to refer to four carbons. Cyclopentane, and now we're getting into kind of the Greek uh, prefixes. So cyclopentane, hexane, and cyclodecane are all examples of molecules that simply use the Greek numbering system as their prefixes. And the wiki explains more in terms of the higher um, prefixes and other suffixes as well. And of course to name the cyclic hydrocarbons we simply prefix the open chain alkane with the word cyclo. So cyclohexane happens to be a cycloalkane we'll deal with quite a bit and we represent that it's cyclic by using the cyclo prefix. What you should, what you'll notice if you take a look at the cycloalkanes is they possess a molecular formula that has two less hydrogens than their open chain analogs. So consider for instance cyclobutane. Cyclobutane is a molecule with four carbons and off of each of the four carbons there are two hydrogens. So we would expect cyclobutane to have the molecular formula C4H8. Oops. 